time, don't we? And it's by way of encouragement to, to, to tell them, and this is probably true especially of Americans, to tell them that they shouldn't give up, that they should set goals in their lives and work hard to achieve them, that they live in a country that affords them tremendous opportunity. They should take, care, take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves in their life. We say to them, and this has just become a truism, you can do anything you set your mind to. We hear it all over the place. It's probably considered to be one of the hallmarks of good parenting nowadays to tell your kids when they're getting ready to go off to college, when they're thinking as maybe younger, thinking about what they want to do with the rest of their life. What do you want to be when you grow up? You can do anything you set your mind to. Well, now that may be true in a sense, as kind of part of the American dream, is the Christian equivalent of that, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Is that just a Christian version of you can do whatever you set your mind to? Greetings and welcome to Issues Etc. We're coming to you live from the studios of Lutheran Public Radio in Collinsville, Illinois. I'm Todd Wilkin. Thanks for tuning us in. Pastor Brian Wolf Miller will be with us to continue our series on responding to evangelical proof texts today. We'll be doing Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. After that, we'll continue our series on the Calvinist confessional documents. Today, we'll take up the big one, the Westminster Confession of Faith, which has laid out in very plain detail in its various articles, predestination, perseverance of the saints, all of those things that have come to be strongly associated with Five Point Calvinism. We'll talk with Pastor Jordan Cooper about that. Pastor Will Whedon will join us in Hour 2. Today, the Church is remembering 4th and 5th century translator of Scripture and one of the big Church Fathers in the West, Jerome. He is said to have died on this day in 420, after having translated from the original languages, Hebrew and Greek, both the Old and the New Testament, into what was the language of his day, the common language of his day, Latin, his translation known as the Vulgate, held sway in the Christian Church for 1,000 years as the standard Latin translation of the Bible. That's an accomplishment in and of itself. Why would why else would we remember Jerome? There are other reasons. We'll get to those in Hour 2 of Issues, etc. And then David Limbaugh will join us. We're going to talk about the case for the biblical Jesus. He is author of his latest book called Jesus on Trial, A Lawyer Affirms the Truth of the Gospel. Our call-in number for the next two hours, one 877 623 877-623-MIIE. Send us an email, talk back at issuesetc.org, or a tweet at issuesetc. And for our beloved on-demand listeners, use that comment line anytime you have a question or a comment, want to add to the conversation, 618-223-8382. 82. Pastor Brian Wolf Miller is a regular guest. He's pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado, and he's co-host of a weekly radio talk show called Table Talk Radio. Brian, welcome back to Issues Etc. Thank you. Great to be back with you, Todd. I'm sure you've said it to your kids. You, you can do anything you set your mind to. I want to be a nurse. Well, you can do anything you set your mind to. Is this passage, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, just kind of the Christian version of that? I remember having uh, th- this uh uh, seeing this verse taped on the ceiling above the bench press machine. <laughs> so there you are, you know, struggling under 100 pounds or 400 pounds. I can't remember exactly how much was on the bar. And uh, and you're grunting and you're trying and you just need a little bit of extra motivation. And so there it is. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's like the go-to motivational verse when you're struggling and you just need a little kick uh, to get through it. And I think exactly how you said it. If you put your mind to it, or if Christ puts your mind to it, you can do it. That's typically how this verse is used. So you always see this verse around locker rooms. You see it on uh, athletic shirts and things like this. Uh, it seems particularly the idea, I mean, if you're looking for a verse uh, about strength, this is the verse you go to. So if you're doing something that has to do with muscles, this is kind of your go-to text. Um, I have a hard time imagining you bench pressing 400 pounds. I know, I know. A lot of reps there. <laughs> okay. But, uh... <laughs> um, so if it isn't just Nike's, you know, uh, do it, uh, or just a slogan that's, that's, you know, for the athlete or for the person who has a, a task he wants to 
uh, run a marathon, something like that. If it isn't that, in its original context, what is Paul saying there in that passage of Philippians? That is the perfect question, because one of the marks of, I mean, the, the series of evangelical proof texts, one, one of the marks of proof texting is that you take a text out of the context and you remove it from uh, from its surrounding verses and even from the context of the writing of the uh, of the letter itself. And then you can really do whatever you want with it. If you can remove a verse from its context, you give it its own context and you can pour your own meaning into it. But the context of it, this verse is really quite stunning. We think that Paul wrote Philippians from the jail in Caesarea. Uh, when, when he, after he finished his third missionary journey, he goes back up to Jerusalem, and some, uh, some of his opponents, the Jews from Ephesus, cause a big uh, stir and accuse Paul of bringing Gentiles into the temple. He gets arrested. There's a big crowd. He preaches his last public sermon, at least that we know of, to the, uh, uh, to the crowds there in Jerusalem. They're about to murder him. Paul's in jail in Jerusalem, and they have to take him in the middle of the night down to Caesarea, because they, they, their mob is going to break into the prison and murder Paul in the middle of the night. And he's there in, the, in prison in Caesarea for a couple of years, and he writes a lot of his letters there, including Philippians. So he's in chains, he's in bondage, he's waiting to uh, have an audience with, uh, um, with the Roman officials in that, to get off, and they're kind of dragging him on, hoping for a bribe uh, so that he can get out. So, here, so you've got to imagine these words, Paul writing these words from prison, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that it gives us uh, at least the general context that he's saying something different than we normally make of it. Okay, so there is, there is a kernel of truth in the evangelical misapplication or mis, misreading of this, and that is this does involve opposition, suffering. I mean, I can't imagine what Paul—it's hard— I, I, you, put an intriguing question in my mind. Here's Paul in prison, likely chained to a wall, saying, I can do all things. Uh, take that apart for us. That's a paradox. Well, so, here, so he, yeah, exactly right. So here is just a few verses before it, uh, starting with uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care but lacked the opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that the strengthening here that comes through Christ to his Christians is especially the strengthening to endure suffering. And this is so important. I mean, normally when we think of our Christian life, we think of the active side of our Christian life, the active side of sanctification, which is really our love for the neighbor. But most of our Christian life, even in our sanctification, is a matter of of passively receiving those things that come to us. And our passive sanctification, that is our life of suffering. And Paul in this verse is talking about the strength that the Lord gives us to suffer. And in fact, in the end, the ultimate strength that the Lord gives us is the strength to die in the faith. I want to come back to that, because that's key, especially in the book of Philippians. I mean, this is Paul, um, certain he is soon to die, if you read that book correctly. Um, So what we're talking here is about endurance, not achievement. Yeah, oh, that's a perfect way to say it. I mean, whenever we think of our, and this is I don't know if this is evangelicalism or our American culture or what, but we're, we're always about doing and achieving and, and making things happen. We're moving. We're pushing forward. We're starting new. We're doing whatever it is. It's all about our own activity. And I suppose that's part of our Christian life. We are called by the Lord to love our neighbor. But, but almost every passage that the New Testament gives to us about sanctification also is about suffering. Luther said, um, this was a great little thing, he said you could make a game to teach the children the scriptures. You'd make four pouches, and you'd read a verse and you'd figure out what pouch it went into. You had the doctrine pouch, which is the law pouch, you're a sinner, and the gospel pouch, your sins are forgiven. And then you have the life pouch, and over there you have two little sections. You have the love for the neighbor section, and you have the suffering section. So that any Bible verse can be grouped into, this is teaching me I'm a sinner, this is promising forgiveness, this is showing me how to love the neighbor, and this is showing me how I'm going to suffer. But I think, Todd, that that last bit, the idea that to be a Christian is to suffer, is almost uh, removed from the, from the Scriptures. 
I mean, Thomas Jefferson took his scissors and cut out all the miracles of Christ, but I think modern American Christianity takes out the scissors and cuts out all the bits about how Christians have to suffer. All right, so they don't have a category for what the context of this original utterance by Paul really is? It, they, don't have a, they don't have a theology of the cross into which this belongs. Right, yeah. I mean, this gets way blown out of proportion with a guy like Joel Osteen, who says if you're suffering, it's because you have lack of faith, that the Lord has all good for you in this life, and things like this. I mean, that, that is this theology taking to its absolutely most ridiculous and absurd uh, uh, extreme. But, but it, it, this strain of glory runs through American evangelicalism that, that I am, if I am a Christian, I'm supposed to have success in this life. Uh, I'm supposed to have, my life is supposed to be marked with victory especially in the victory of overcoming sin, but also just in the victory of, of, uh, of living a good and happy and healthy life. And that is not ever promised to us. It's never, the, the, the Lord Jesus, I mean, first, he never promises a tomorrow to us, much less uh, any sort of victorious uh, tomorrow. Pastor Brian Wolfmiller is our guest. We'll take a break and we'll Continue with him on the other side on this Tuesday afternoon, September the 30th, our ongoing series on responding to evangelical proof texts today, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Pastor Brian Wolfmiller is pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado. Do you have a hard time finding Christian greeting cards and gifts that aren't either sappy or theologically suspect? Ad Crucem offers the perfect combination of art and the truth of the scriptures with beautiful and reverent greeting cards and gifts. Deliver the true comfort of the gospel, Christ crucified for sinners, to family and friends with Ad Crucem. A-D-C-R-U-C-E-M dot com. Confessing the faith through art and word. Ad Crucem dot com. Did you know that we send out an email each week that details upcoming show topics? It's available for you to include in your weekly church bulletin. Just click the Issues Etc. Journal logo at our homepage, issuesetc.org, and sign up to receive the church bulletin blurb. It's an easy way to invite your fellow parishioners to listen to Issues Etc. Issuesetc.org. Look for the Issues Etc. Journal logo and register to receive a weekly bulletin paragraph from Issues Etc. Christ-centered, cross-focused, you're listening to Issues Etc. We talk to the biggest names in religion today. Liberal Bishop John Shelby Spong. I don't think Jesus ever preached the Sermon on the Mount, for example. I don't believe anybody ever took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 people. I don't believe that's possible to do. Liberal Bible critic Bart Ehrman. There's a difference between what the historical Jesus actually said and what the Gospels say he said. And to understand what the historical Jesus was really like, we have to get behind the Gospels. Muslim critic of Christianity, Reza Aslan. By definition, the resurrection is an ahistorical event, and so therefore historians have no right, no, no business uh, commenting upon it. Where else on Christian radio will you hear these guests challenged with important questions? Talk radio for the thinking Christian, Issues Etc. Listen live or on demand at issuesetc.org. Welcome back to Issues Etc. I'm Todd Wilkin. On this Tuesday afternoon, we're talking with Pastor Brian Wolf Miller, continuing our series on responding to evangelical proof texts. The text today is, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You made an intriguing connection here between what you called our passive sanctification, and I'll ask you to explain that a little bit more. And it sounds like what you said before the break was that uh, that sanctification, part of it, in fact, the last part of it, is our death. Go into that, if you would. Brian. That's right. Well, I mean, if you look at it, what is the most Christian thing that Jesus ever did? <laughs> it was that he died on the cross. He handed himself over to uh, wicked men, uh, and even to the wrath of God, to be destroyed. 
which is a stunning sort of thing. That's why we call it the passion of Jesus, because he was, in fact, passive in the whole thing. It was happening to him. Now, that's an amazing sort of thing. Now, of course, Jesus was, everything that he did was to get there. He was driving towards the cross because he must be crucified for us. So it's not an accident that it happened. But that, it, but that the cross is, in fact, something that happens to our Lord Jesus. And when Jesus tells us to take up the cross and follow him, he's, he's setting us into a life of of receiving, and we receive good gifts from him, and we receive all sorts of terrible gifts from the world and the flesh and the devil, and we live this this passive life, so that when the scriptures want to give us the example of Jesus, there's one text, and, and, and Peter gives it to us, where he says that Jesus is our example, uh, but he's not as a, our example in the good works that he did, he's not our example in the in the activities that he, uh, the, uh, the miracles and the teachings and all this sort of stuff. He's our example in that he suffered without opening his mouth, says Peter. So that Jesus gives us, his Christians, an example of suffering, how to receive uh, all of this from the Lord. And this culminates then in our death, which is, I suppose, this might be a strange way to think of it, this is the last good work that we accomplish in this life. That we, that we uh, uh, breathe our last breath trusting in the name of Jesus to save us uh, from our sins, from the wrath of God, uh, and from hell itself. So we go facing our death with courage. We're not afraid to die. We have this great hope of the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And now, because we're free to die, we are also free to live. That, that means that when Paul utters these words, I can do all things, it includes his death. In, in fact, most of all, it includes his death. And that's what Paul is saying. I've learned what it means to have plenty. I've learned what it means to have nothing. I've learned what it means to be honored. I've learned what it means to be ashamed. I've learned what it means to be trampled on uh, by men. I've learned what it means to suffer, to be ridiculed, to be rejected. And at last, I will know uh, what it means to be martyred, to be put to death. But this, too, I do through Christ who strengthens me, so that I can now uh, depart this life Trusting in the Lord Jesus, I have strength to do that great thing, to suffer for the name of my Lord uh, through Christ. I, I want you to talk also about the certain idolatry that this may respond to, a right reading of this passage may respond to. You spoke earlier about Joel Osteen. Um, it is this kind of constant, I need to achieve more financial health relationships, you name whatever facet of your life it is, he is constantly driving his people forward with verses like this, saying, you can do it, you can do it, Mm -hmm. you know, just try harder. And you say that that betrays the idol of covetousness. Talk about that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, when when Jesus becomes the um, means to an end in my thinking and my my theology, now... um, now, I have a, something that I want to achieve. I mean, maybe I want to become uh, a, a president of the United States, or maybe I just want to lift this weight, or I want to, like you said, run the marathon, or I want to accomplish something. Uh, now I have my own goals and my own dreams and my own visions, and Jesus is going to be the one who helps me get there. This, this turns Jesus from a person into a vitamin, uh, from the God and Savior that we worship and adore to the, to the kind of Gatorade drink that we need to make it to the end of the quarter. Uh, th- th- this takes the one uh, who hears our prayers and answers them uh, and, and makes him into uh, just kind of the assistant who comes along when we're, uh, when we're in need. And so th- this, uh, this betrays a completely wrong-headed idea of who Jesus is. Uh, it, it, it wasn't like Paul had a bunch of things that he wanted to accomplish. And he says, boy, it's a good thing I got Jesus to kind of boost me up or give me a spot or help me along. No, uh, Jesus was the reason and the end of everything that Paul was doing. And because of that, he could have this confidence. It's a confidence not in himself with Jesus helping him, but a confidence in Jesus and not himself, right? Yeah, 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 in spite of himself. Paul knows his own failures and weaknesses and his own fears. You know, he, he knows. I mean, one of the marks of our fallen humanity is that we're afraid of death. Hebrews 2 takes this up and says that the devil holds us in bondage through the fear of death. This is one of the common temptations that all men have. And, that, and Paul shared all of these things with us, uh, with, with, with us men, with us sinners. And yet through Christ, 
And through his death and resurrection, he's even set free of this fear, the fear of death and the fear of suffering, uh, the fear of mockery and shame, so that he can go through all of these things with Christ to his side. So that's right, is exactly what you said, that Paul's able to, to speak these great words of confidence and boldness, not because of his strength, but in spite of his weaknesses. So this goes beautifully with Paul saying, I boast in my weakness. Um, in, uh, it seems to kind of go hand in hand with uh, Christ's comforting words to him, my strength is made perfect in weakness. It, this would be a great guide for reading that verse as well. Oh yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, here Paul has some sort of thorn in the flesh, and he prays, Lord, take this from me. And this is a pivotal moment for Paul. He, he'll he repeat it to the Corinthians um, as, his, as the Lord is teaching Paul himself uh, what he has to do and what he has to suffer. In fact, part of Paul's call into the apostolic ministry is that he would have to suffer many great things for the Lord's name. And so Paul is praying, Lord, take this thorn from me. And Jesus says, no, <laughs> your, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. So that, this, so that Paul, when he's trusting these words, is not praying that Jesus is somehow kind of pumping him up, but rather that even in spite of his weaknesses, the Lord is present uh, with his blessings. The, 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 the prepositions are always very powerful when Paul uses them, and the one here that is at work is through Christ. I can do all things through him, through Christ. How should we rightly understand that? Is that similar to in Christ? Yeah, I suppose that this is exactly when Jesus says, uh, when you ask anything in my name, uh, I will give it to you, this sort of thing, so that the, uh, the Lord's promises of, of hearing every prayer and answering every prayer and giving us all strength is uh, bound up to his gracious will in Christ. So when the Lord gives us a promise, then we know that he also keeps that promise. Uh, and when we pray for him to, to keep that promise with us, he answers it. And so here Paul is doing um, is suffering all these things and enduring all of these things and, uh, and learning all of these things, not apart from Christ, but precisely in the apostolic ministry in which Christ called him. So if it's... And, and he has great joy in doing this, too. I mean, that's the other thing, that, that Paul is not just given strength to endure, but he's given this, this supernatural uh, spiritual gift of having joy in the midst of all of these tribulations. And in fact, it's this joy in the midst of sorrow, not just enduring the sorrow and, and, and kind of enduring through it, but that Paul maintains hope and he maintains joy in the midst of it that becomes a mark of the fact that this is a work of Jesus. We're not mystics and we, and we believe firmly in the means of grace, and we talk about the Lord's Supper for the strengthening of faith. It doesn't give physical strength. It doesn't give mental strength. It gives the strength that is faith. Is that the kind of strength, and is that the means that Paul would point us to to be strengthened in Christ. Yeah, it is the strength. Now, this is amazing. It is exactly right. It is the strength of a good conscience. <laughs> it is the strength of a heart that knows that even though the world is set against him, Christ is for him, and that Jesus loves him, and that Jesus even likes him, that Jesus delights in Paul, that Jesus has a place for him in heaven, that Jesus has covered Paul with his blood and put him right there where he wants him, and that Jesus will never leave him or forsake him, that in spite of his sin and in spite of his weakness, Jesus is pleased to call Paul his friend. That kind of good conscience, that, that absolute assurance that, that you are there with Christ, that is the strength that, uh, that drives our Christian life and our prayers and everything else that, uh, as we face suffering in this world. Uh, it, it's what, it, it, it is the strength of knowing that even if the world is against me, if the mountains fall into the sea, that I am safe and secure in the hands of, of my Lord Jesus. Well, finally then, kind of back where we started, should we tell our kids... We certainly shouldn't tell our kids you can do all, all things through Christ who strengthens you as a way of saying, go get them, kid. You know, you just work hard and push forward. Should we still tell our kids you can do anything you set your mind to? <laughs> no, but we should teach them this verse. <laughs> and we should teach it to them rightly and say, look, in, the, in good times and in bad, Christ is with you. 
When you, have, when you are sick and when you are well, Jesus is with you. When you are loved and when you are hated, Jesus is with you. And, and he is not far from you in shame and sin and in suffering, but that he is your Lord and that he will see you through this life and he will see you through death. So that everything that happens to you in this life, even if it seems like the whole world is against you, you are in the midst of that with Jesus. And he is your strength, and he is your confidence, and he is your salvation. Pastor Brian Wolfmiller is pastor of Hope Lutheran Church in Aurora, Colorado, and he's co-host of a weekly radio talk show called Table Talk Radio. You can find out more about Table Talk Radio at our website, issuesetc.org. Click Listen On Demand. Next week on Responding to Evangelical Proof Texts, we're going to have Pastor Wolf Miller answer the question, Does Matthew eleven twenty eight teach decision theology? Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's next time with Pastor Brian Wolf Miller. Brian, thanks for being our guest. Great to be with you, Todd. Thank you. We've got a new Issues Etc. journal out, and in it is a tremendous story that Pastor Dennis McFadden tells of 60 years spent as a Baptist and deep within Baptist churches as pastor, as administrator, and then he begins to read Luther. He begins to read in Lutheran theology. He discovers the Lutheran Confessions, and now he is a Lutheran pastor at long last. It's a great story from Pastor Dennis McFadden. you got to read it in the latest issues, etc. journal. I also have an article in there, part one of, of an essay I've been writing on Lord's Day, Lord's House, and Lord's Supper. You can read it for yourself absolutely free. Go to our website, issuesetc.org, click the big red button, leave your email address, and we will send you absolutely free the online Issues Etc. journal. When we come back in the second half hour of the program, Pastor Jordan Cooper is going to join us, part two of our series with him on Calvinist confessional documents. We'll take up the big one today, the Westminster Confession of Faith. Would you like for us to post information about your congregation on the Find a Church page of our website? We'll add your church when it becomes part of the Issues Etc. 300. We're looking for 300 congregations to donate $1,000 to Issues Etc. Please consider adding the worldwide outreach of Issues Etc. to your church's mission or advertising budget. Find out more about the Issues Etc. 300 at issuesetc.org. Click support and publicize your congregation to the world. Hello, I'm Pastor Daniel Quinn, Senior Pastor of Living Word Lutheran Church, The Woodlands, Texas, inviting you to join us for divine service on Sundays at 8.15 or 11 a.m. Living Word is located at 9500 North Panther Creek Drive in The Woodlands, a community about 30 miles north of Houston. That's Living Word Lutheran Church, where we proclaim the living word of Christ that all who hear may walk in newness of life. The Church's Music from the 20th Century. The 17th Century. The 11th Century. The 8th century. The 4th century. The best of the church's music from the past 2,000 years. LutheranPublicRadio.org Talk radio for recovering evangelicals. You're listening to Issues Etc. Would you like to learn about the Reformation theology you hear on Issues Etc.? We'll send you a pamphlet of Luther's small catechism for free. It contains the biblical teachings on the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, Baptism, the Lord's Supper, and Confession and Absolution. Order your free copy of Luther's Small Catechism today. Just send your name and mailing address to talkback at issuesetc.org. 
For 20 years, we've lifted our voices and instruments to the hymns of Stephen Starkey. Now, CPH has the first ever CD collection of Pastor Starkey's works titled, We Praise You and Acknowledge You, O God. This 12-track CD includes nearly an hour of music from the most beloved Lutheran hymn writer of our time. Order now. Use promotion code URA. We Praise You and Acknowledge You, O God, is only $15.99. CPH.org. 